That's the beauty of CBA Live. That was unscripted. I, I knew he was back there. I got to tell you, we've got a little code word going on when he was here because he was going to show up five minutes before he was supposed to get here. So we're, we, we've been in, in production and saying, okay, what happens if he doesn't show up? What do we have to kill? Can y'all let her go longer? And I think she could have gone an hour, thankfully. She could have. But we had a code word down on the screen, Elvis. <laughs> which tells me Elvis is in the building and we can go to the next session. So joining us is one Joseph Otting. Who, Thank you. Great to be here. You Thank didn't you. tell me you were playing golf today. I am not playing golf today. <laughs> I got work to do. I never played during the week. You know that. At least you can tell the crowd that. That's terrific. The, the week defined it as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So. <laughs> So you were the 31st comptroller of the OCC. Yes. You were the first person with banking experience to hold this position since the first year of the Ronald Reagan administration. Wow. That's embarrassing. I Cannot hear. believe it's taken that long to get somebody with some type of experience there. Now you once made a mention to me that this was the best job in town to have because you're A number one, you're not part of a commission. I wasn't, you weren't supposed to repeat that, Richard. <laughs> but it is easy. No, no I, I, think, I think one of the great things about the OCC, it's not only its tradition back to 1863, but I think, you know, what the mission is, is a safety and soundness of the U.S. banking system, but also ensuring people have access to that system and that the banks follow the laws. Um, and I, I think one of the great things about that is our organizational structure allows us to move quickly, I think, to uh, 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 create change when change is necessary, um, to be able to uh, communicate a consistent message. And I think if you look over the years, one of the real consistent things in the banking industry has been the OCC and their approach to regulatory supervision. Okay, so you've been a banker for over 35 years. Yep. Bank of America, Union Bank, U.S. Bank, One West, of course. And all of a sudden, I assume you got a phone call. And I guess it was Steve Mnuchin? I, uh, th there was probably a succession of discussions on this issue because uh, fortunately for me, I was part of the early transition team of identifying and I had responsibility for the financial vertical, which included, you know, Treasury and trade and FDIC and OCC of coming up with the names for candidates for those respective jobs. So, so every time my name got on the list, I drew a line through it. Um, uh, thinking, you know, personally going to Washington was, nor, uh, was never in my kind of career path or desire. And most of the times I went to work after I left the banking industry in a pair of shorts and a golf shirt and a pair of golf shoes and I worked for a couple hours and then got a chance to enjoy uh, one of the assets that my family owns. Um, and so re-entering back into the work environment, specifically going into Washington wasn't what was on my agenda. But I, I'm so fortunate that I did take that step and uh, was able to put a part of uh, coming to Washington with an agenda with three or four items that I thought were really important to the banking industry, one being CRA. Um, as a banker, I think most of you know how complicated and difficult that is. Um, and being able to bring clarity and consistency to CRA was important. Small ticket consumer lending and small business lending was very important to me. Um, I would ask people in the audience, but I think I know the answer to this is, you know, do you like the current BSA AML? I think most bankers would say they understand our responsibility to make sure that, you know, not bad money goes into the banking system and comes out clean. But what, how we do that today, we definitely can evolve that to make that more efficient. And then I really feel fintechs um, have a space in the banking industry. They have to act like a bank, they have to have risk management like a bank, they have to have capital like a bank and liquidity, but there is a role for fintechs and I thought I could help you know, continue the work that Tom Curry had done. So you came to DC with an agenda. I assume you said, if I take the job, here are the four things I must do. That's right. I will tell you, nobody in this town was thinking about modernizing, changing, fixing CRA, but you. And some say I need my head examined. So I'll continue that line of thought. <laughs> Some people will say, you don't know Washington, D.C. That people come with great ideas and goals, but when they come to Washington, the bureaucracy is going to take you down. Congress is going to hold you up. The consumer groups are going to stop you. Have they stopped you yet? 
I don't think so. Um, I, I do think it is an education process when you come to Washington, D.C. about how actually things get done. Um, but I think similar to each of you sitting out there is that when you have a goal and you have a mission and you don't lose sight of that, uh, I, I would tell you I arrived on November 27th. It um, uh, was the day I was confirmed. And on November 28th, we started talking about CRA. And, and while it is a, a jagged path, so to speak, the way you described it, to get a rule done, if you stay consistent in your mission and you know that's important to you and it's important to the, to the world um, of being able to fix this, then, then you know that's what you're going to get done. And, and there have been some bumps. I mean, you know, we put the ANPR out by ourselves. I would have preferred that we did that together, but we finally got to the point where I said we need that feedback from the market. We need that feedback from community groups. We need it from the bank to be able to go to the next level. And so we took a step um, that was criticized by a lot of people initially about issuing that ANPR. But I think today the OCC gets a lots of acclaim for being able to do that and willing to do that. And it moved the CRA program down the road significantly. Okay, so where are you on CRA? Obviously you thought CRA was not working. Being a, a former banker, you said it's not working. What were the worst parts, or what are the worst parts of CRA that you said you need to fix? Well, um, there's a couple people, I think, in the audience tonight, uh, or audience this, at, this morning, um, who I consider to be CRA experts. And I came over here on Monday thinking Richard was going to be at the bar buying drinks, but obviously that wasn't the case. Um, uh, and I sat down with those people, and, and the most amazing thing that I will tell you is I have probably met with over 1,100 people about CRA since I've come to Washington, D.C. I've met with people one-on-one. -on -one. I've met with people in large groups. I've met with, you know, uh, uh, nonprofits, civil rights organizations, and banks. And of those 1,100 people, only two people could accurately describe to me the way that CRA was measured, believe it or not. And I was, on Monday night, I was with some people that I would consider to be one of the top 10 CRA people in the world. And I asked that person to give me how CRA is evaluated. Now, he had a methodology, but the methodology wasn't the way that CRA was supposed to be uh, measured. So I think there are four things that, that are really important in my mind. We have to clarify for financial institutions and community groups, what does qualify for CRA? And I will tell you, there is tremendous inconsistency. What, can qualify in Chicago is different than what qualifies in LA. What qualifies in San Francisco is different than what qualifies in Miami. So we really think giving you certainty on what qualifies will allow banks to do more. The second issue is, you know, um, if you don't have a way to make a determination what qualifies, you have a tendency to move back to the center of the plate because you don't want to take the risk that you make that investment or do that loan and two years later when the exam happens to find out that it's not included. So we feel, and so does the FDIC and the Fed, that we should give you the option to come in and get a read on something that you're going to do. So you don't have to make, you don't have to make that guess, but you have certainty around that. And I think what that'll allow people to do is be more creative in their communities of how they want to serve CRA. Because without that, what happens is people just move back to the middle and buy mortgage-backed securities. And we want people to be a creative in the pros. So number one is giving you certainty. The second is, is how we measure CRA. And, and there is a little bit of dialogue around the three regulators about how to move to a more objective way to measure. But for those who know how CRA is done today is basically we assign points in lending, investments, and community service. Um, but what I say about that system today is you can be the best of the worst of the worst of the best and it'll impact your rating. Because if you are the best of the worst in your market that does really bad in CRA, you can be outstanding. But that same person who was in a normal market would be viewed probably as needs improvement. And so we need to be able to say to institutions, here's, here's the objective way that you could be measured in CRA. The third area we want to resolve is the issues around assessment areas. I think, I think what has happened over the years, we've boxed institutions into their assessment areas. And unless it's in your assessment area, banks very rarely deviate outside the assessment area. And what we've seen over the years is banks have consolidated down. We have had other areas that banks would like to support, but they're restricted because they won't inclu be included in their overall rating. And the last thing which I think is really important also is that we figure out how to measure 
the volume of CRA activities that are being done in the banking industry today, because I personally believe when people see those numbers, I think they will be surprised how active banks are in their communities across America. By our calculation in 2017, there was roughly $480 million of CRA activity that was done across the United States, which, uh, 480 billion, I'm sorry, billion, uh, of, of dollars trillion. that was done in 2017. And if we can move towards where we can track that and maybe in cent areas where we need to have greater CRA, I think that will be helpful for the industry and I think it'll be helpful for communities across America. So breaking each of those four down, the single metric system you were looking at and you got opinions on, is that making progress or is that DOA? Well, first, first of all, I, I would say is, I think it's a, uh, a little bit of a folklore that we just wanted to have one metric. Um, uh, there was one particular group that, you know, took that as facts and then spread that rumor, had a lot of people within their association write letters that they didn't support the single metric. But I would tell you, if you look at the AMPR, Never at any point in time did we say one metric. <clears throat> we do think being able to make that objective um, and, and look at areas that you are doing business and measuring it, and then also measuring at the top of the corporation um, from a value perspective, we think that's the way we'll ultimately try to get to some type of measurement criteria. And going back to assessment area, you tell the story when you're out in Pasadena, you went and invest in other areas that really needed it, but you didn't have a footprint there. So is there a metric there, is, and I'm just gonna make these numbers up, that a bank will have to invest 75% of its CRA in its footprint and option of a 25 somewhere else? Is it 90, 10? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the, I think, really positives of the AMPR was we gathered a lot of feedback from people who are sitting in the audience today and you gave us very constructive feedback. Um, and one of the uh, things that people asked us to resolve was, um, I, I want to support my local community, but maybe one county over or one city over or on the other side of the river, there is a very high community in need that we want to help support, um, but we can't get credit for CRA for that. And so um, one solution that came through that some people came up with an idea is have a bank do 75% of their CRA activity in their local community and give them 25% of their CRA dollars to be able to go to other communities and support those. Um, and, and we actually looked at that a lot. I, I would say we've actually come up with another approach, which we think we hopefully can have dialogue with the Fed and the FDIC on, is, is establish some minimum criteria for your area to where you're doing banking. And then once you know that you've met your minimums in that area, give you the flexibility to go out and do other communities that allow yourself to be able to qualify for an outstanding rating. So, so it meets that concept of you have to fulfill in your respective areas where you have your headquarters or your branches or your customers are, but give you the ability to go out and do more if you so choose and be able to do that in a broader geographic market. So obviously it would be great for the banking industry if the FDIC and the Fed are all on the same page. Making progress in that arena? Um, do you think it would be great if they do or are you asking? It would be. Yeah, are I, you making progress with I, those other I, two agencies? I, I think so. Um, you know, uh, I have said from the day one that I would like this to be a joint rule. Um, uh, and and I, we're all heading down that track to do that collectively together. The next 90 days are gonna be really important as we have lots of meetings. And I, I would say today, my guess is we're 80, 90% aligned uh, together of how to do this. There'll be some nuances that we'll have to work our way through. But I do think that this is gaining momentum um, where you know it was a big rock to push up the hill initially. I think we've hit the top of the hill and we're on the downside of the hill now. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very excited about where we are. And I think you know if we could solve this issue in my mind, um, I really believe banks want to do more for communities across America. I think we have a responsibility to do this, but you need clarity, you need consistency, and you need you know, feedback of how to do that, and I think banks will do more across America. So let's say you try and do everything you can to get the FDIC and the Fed on board, but you're getting pushback from those two. Are you willing to move CRA on your own? You know, what, what I've said in this regard is, I don't think I'm gonna have to. Um, I do think that we can reach a common uh, uh, position on this. 
Um, however, I would also say that the national banks that we supervise, probably between lending investments, probably represents you know 70 to 75 percent of the assets that are covered under CRA. And I do feel that we have a responsibility to communities across America and our banks to bring that clarity to CRA. Um, and so I hope we don't have to get to that point, and I don't think we will, but, but I do feel that responsibility. One question I pose to Chair McWilliams. I said if we're at CB Live March of next year, will CRA be done? All three on the same page. Yeah, I think we should move the conference up to December of this year. Okay. Fair enough. So um, as I'm opening up gifts, <laughs> I'll remember this statement. Okay. I hope if I'm a recipient of gifts. <laughs> Apparently I didn't get chocolate brownies either. Okay. So just move anything else on CRA you want to convey? No, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Okay. And you did read all 1,500 comment letters? I did. Every single one of them? I did. Okay. Any major surprises? Um, I, the one surprise that I would say was the smaller banks across America, how, how outspoken they were about the need to change CRA. Smaller banks. That's right. That, that um, uh, you know, when I was growing up in my small town in Maquoket, Iowa, which was about 6,500 people, mm -hmm. I mean, the bank supported the Little League. They supported the local arts, you know, when there were any events in our community, you know, the one person that you could always count on to be there was somebody from the bank. And they not only brought their talent and expertise, but they brought capital. And, and I think w over the years, we've emerged and taken away from what banks can do in their local communities because of the uncertainty. And I think what smaller banks are asking for is give us certainty and recognize that sometimes in the markets that we're operating in, we don't have all the uh, low to moderate income lending that we need. Or my business model is I serve farmers and small businesses. And by making me have to buy mortgage-backed securities, I'm stepping outside my area of expertise. Um, and so give me more options where I have expertise and it's part of my business plan to solve my uh, CRA requirement. Never a voice about I don't want to do more or I'm doing too much but don't force me to do something that, that is uh, uh, unnatural for either my market or for my bank. Great. So help me out here if you don't mind about this new FinTech, so-called new FinTech world. You're looking at a, a, a charter for FinTechs and there's something called a special purpose bank charter. Uh -huh. Is there a difference? Um, well, there's a, there's a difference in the sense of uh, how they approach the market. And, and how they generally approach their clients and how they service their clients than what we generally see in, in, in financial institutions today. Um, but, you know, I've told this story in the past is when Tom Curry started down this journey, there were probably 250 fintechs across the world that thought they wanted to be banks in the United States. Um, and then, you know, we established, you know, a, a group within the OCC under Beth Knickerbocker, which was an innovation office, where we encouraged both banks and fintechs to come in and talk to us and act as a resource to, you know, that particular segment of the industry. Um, a lot of those 250 fintechs quickly realized being a bank is a highly difficult thing. You know, if you think about a fintech, they are quick to market, you know, limited infrastructure, no risk management, um, uh, uh, solution oriented. And if you look at a bank, we are about capital and about liquidity and about process and about procedures and about risk management. And so quickly a lot of the fintechs realized the last thing they wanted to be was a bank. Um, and so what we spend a fair amount of time in the innovation office with a large population <clears throat> people is how do I partner with banks and help banks today if I have a great way to underwrite credit or a great way to help a bank seek new customers or help a bank interact with their customers. I think that's where FinTech will have an enormous, I think, uh, influence over the next three to five years. But there are still a population of people who generally have been operating in the lending space who feel they need a national bank to be able to operate nationally. And I do think there is a nice niche there for 
um, those type of institutions to offer small dollar consumer loans and small dollar business loans that you know generally are difficult for banks to do on a, a large volume basis. And a lot of those have partnered with banks to either offer that as a product for them or after they originate the loans to be able to sell those loans to the financial institution. And so I, I, we, have, we announced last year that we would entertain a national bank charter for a fintech. But when you line these up, I think you know, the same responsibilities that we expect of a bank, we will expect of a fintech, with the only other element being that of you know, a, a national bank that they don't take deposits won't have CRA goals. But what we've said is they have to have a financial inclusion plan that in our mind will look like CRA um, requirements going forward. So what I have heard from many, many bankers that have talked to me about this is, hey, I'm all for competition. Throw the ball up in the air and we'll compete with anybody, but don't give anybody a competitive advantage. And we took that to heart when we did the review about FinTech and we said, we, you know, we're gonna make FinTechs you know, compete head on with financial institutions and that's our goal. And how many of these FinTech folks have said to you, we want that charter? That is a number that we haven't disclosed. But there's more than one? There, there are people in the process. Yes. And how long do you think that process will take once they apply? Well, it would be, it would be no different than a uh, 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 de novo bank operation in most instances. I, I would say uh, all of the fintechs that generally have spoken to us have been in business for a number of years performing their functions, so we have good track records around their processes and their risk management. Um, but, you know, a, a normal bank charter between you know, initial discussions, filing a preliminary application, then filing a formal application generally takes somewhere between six and nine months depending upon the complexities of the institutions. And at what month during that process does the public know someone has applied? When they file a formal application. They do the formal one. Progress on AML BSA is one of your other priorities. Yeah, um, I, I actually am pretty excited about where we are on, on this. Um, uh, after I got here as a banker, um, I convened the Fed and the FDIC and the National Credit Union and the FinTech people, or FinCEN people, to just have a meeting. And they, we hadn't been having meetings like that. And we laid out a number of priorities of issues that we felt we needed to fix. Um, and there are two ways to look, I think, at AML BSA. It's taking what we have today and allowing people to use technology and new processes to be in compliance with the requirements. And then there's what FinTech should look like, or excuse me, what AML BSA probably will look like in the future. So let me address the first part. Um, we have spent a, a fairly significant amount of time. Um, every week we have staff that meet on AML BSA and then all of the principals meet once a month to make sure that if there are any decisions needed or to be able to move things forward. Um, and you've seen some of these that have come out like allowing smaller banks to share resources on AML BSA. Um, we came out with a, uh, 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 a, a, a statement allowing financial institutions to be able to try new ways and new technologies to be able to satisfy their requirements. And there's some things I'll speak on in the future. Um, we're about ready to come out with a new examination um, booklet, which, you know, there's kind of a couple concepts that we're excited about. If you've been in compliance with AML BSA laws and you've done it really successfully, you know, we, the way it's currently written is we always have to go back to the very beginning and put you through the whole exam. That's really what we don't do normally with most examinations. We are risk-based and we look at the risk and we think that, you know, if somebody has done it successfully over many years, we don't have to go back to the beginning all the time. And so offering up some flexibility and judgment to examiners in the AML BSA I think will be quite helpful. So you've seen those things kind of coming out of that initiative. I do think in the future, um, there's some really kind of uh, unique things that are being done about what's the future of AML BSA look like today. There's some groups that have, you know, creating a, a depository to put data together um, and, and not having personal information, but being able to see because today we report AML BSA by institution. Um, and, and, and having the ability to look at, well, if somebody comes into an institution with money and moves it to bank B and then over to bank C and out the back door, there's good learnings from uh, that process about what are the characteristics of a money launder. 
Well, there's usually some unique characteristics. They make large, relatively large deposits. They move the money around, and it usually exits relatively quickly. So, so using artificial intelligence to be able to examine that and those characteristics, I think, are going to be quite helpful in the future. And then there's other institutions that are proposing because I think everybody realizes about 7% of the transactions hit the tripwire um, on the SARS, and then it takes an enormous amount of work to get from the 7% to the 2% where a SARS is actually filed. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are now saying, well, why don't we just give the gross SARS data um, to FinCEN and not have all that work between the 7 and the 2%. And that way they get more data, we're not spending all that effort. And I think you're going to start to see some initiatives around that going forward. And then Richard Davis once told us that in 2013, when the OCC issued the guidance on small dollar lending, thousands of his customers walked across the street to the payday lenders. What are you doing to get our banks back into the system? Well, I think, I think often the small ticket lending is the way to do that. Um, uh, uh, I don't know the particular circumstances of why Richard felt that that occurred. Um, I, I do know there were some rules around leasing that, you know, a, a, a consumer protection around leasing that he felt that were somewhat negative. But, but I'm a big believer that, you know, and it's not 100% of the population, and let's just say it's 40% of the population today that has to go to a non-bank. Right. Banks are the best of getting people into the system, talking to them about financial advisory, helping people to stair-step themselves back in from maybe a small dollar loan to a checking account, and then from that checking account to maybe a car loan, and then from that car loan to a home loan, and then from a home loan to helping them save for their children's education. That's what financial institutions of banks do really well across America. And not giving consumers that first entryway into the banking system, I think is very negative and, and uh, complicated and problematic. And you're running the OCC much like you run a company. You Thank actually you. basically return money Thank to the you. banks by lowering assessments. Yes. I don't, I don't know the exact facts on this, but uh, we did lower our assessments 10% last year to national banks. Um, uh, probably uh, Morris and Brian are sitting in the audience. They could tell me when the last time that that's done, but I can't recall any time that that's been done. But we took a really hard look at the OCC and similar to each of you who you've heard the word efficiency ratio and you've looked hard at your operation, we've done the same thing. We, we looked at how we were doing things in the agency. We looked at where we were doing it in the agency. Could we consolidate activities and efforts? From the day I arrived with the budget that was in place, we're on a, a, a September you know, uh, starts our fiscal year. We were scheduled to go up a hundred million dollars and we actually went down about twenty million dollars last year. So we think we saved about a hundred million dollars of expenses. Um, we've been highly disciplined around, you know, the things that, that we think we can control in our expense structure. We do think we're budgeting to be down twenty million this year. We probably will be down more than that. And it's just from being good stewards of those dollars that are given to us and really asking ourselves, is this the best way to do things at the agency? And I think the impact is, um, uh, I, I would like to think when you're interacting with the agency that you're getting quicker, crisper responses back from the agency when you inquire about things within the organization and that we have a sense of urgency when you contact us. So we've been talking about examination consistency across the country. Yeah. Do you think your examiners are pretty consistent right now? Are they better than they were when you started? You have a long way to go? Um, well, here's what I would say to that is the third big leg of our stool um, that we took on as an initiative was to re-empowering the ADCs and EICs in the field of the OCC across America. Um, we surveyed our um, a EICs and ADCs in February of last year. We took the feedback because right or wrong, um, and sometimes it makes sense, is a lot of the decision making got concentrated here in Washington, D.C. Um, and I believe these people that are highly experienced that interact with management and boards should be able to use their judgment. And so what we've done is we've asked the EICs and ADCs 
to empower them to be able to make decisions with branch manager or with the executive and boards. Mm -hmm. Now that we still want them to use the legal department and compliance and CRA specialists in Washington D.C., but nothing gets done without them supporting that effort. And so when you say, I do think we are consistent, I think we are one of the most consistent, but I also think that we do need flexibility and judgment out in the field um, where there are uniqueness to financial institutions, and I support um, using that expertise at the OCC. And when it comes to examinations, do you believe there's better regulatory coordination between you and the other agencies? We've talked about the cross-selling examinations we had. We had multiple agencies in the bank at the same time on the same issue. Yeah. Um, I, I, I see less of that, Richard, today. Um, I think after the crisis, all, all of the institutions were confronted with, you know, the Fed feeling that they needed to be more empowered and the FDIC needed to be more empowered and the CFPB needed to be more empowered and the OCC felt they needed to be more empowered. And as a CEO of a bank at that point in time, I share that viewpoint was, you know, uh, the OCC was coming in the door at the same time the Fed was announcing they were arriving while well, the CFPB right. was showing up. And, the, and the, the crime of all that, in my mind, was not that they wanted to show up and, and look at the bank, but they all wanted their information differently. Um, and I think what has happened since then, there's been much better coordination about who is the primary on various things within the banks, and there's better coordination and sharing. I will tell you, um, we referenced it uh, when Yellen was out here. Randy, Yellen, and I meet for an hour every week on the phone, and we meet uh, once a month for lunch just to talk about policy and rules and regulation and supervision. And then we also meet once a month to go over the AML BSA. So we have a really strong coordination about our institutions. And then I would say if there is something that you know is an issue, we don't w let it wait for a month. We get on the phone with each other and try to try to hammer it out. And I, I I can't comment on you know Marty and Tom and you know the Fed's approach to that in the past. But I know the way it works in the business world is if you talk about things, you can generally solve those. And we are all committed to you know frequent conversation. That is a breath of fresh air. Appreciate yep. that very much. Let's take a, a thirty thousand foot level about the state of banking. Former yep. banker, now regulator. Obviously, we just had a big merger with BB&T and SunTrust. Let's call it 4,800 banks. Let's call it 80,000 branches. Tell me in your mind, five years from now, six years from now, the, the status of banking. Um, well, there, there is definitely this trend line of being less banks. And, and, I, and I don't see that necessarily um, changing. I think we do see a glide path where, where there will be less banks probably five years from now than what there was five years ago and what there is today. How, however, I will say there is a bit of a resurgence of de novo bank uh, activity. And I think predominantly what happened was is if you think about in 2010 through really 2014, banks were, you know, especially small banks, were trading pretty close to book value. So if you were an investor in a community that felt you know, that your large bank or the banks in the community weren't serving the community, it didn't make a lot of sense to say, well, let's all put a dollar in the bank. It'll probably have some operating losses so that dollar becomes worth 80 cents. So five years later, it's worth a dollar again. You know what I mean was the concept. But now people are seeing that the, the uh, independent banks and smaller banks across America are fulfilling a role and the returns are now getting up to where they're covering the cost of capital, and there's some regulatory relief, and they're seeing loan growth and activities in their balance sheet. There's optimism about those banks, and so I think what you're gonna see is the number of declining banks, when there were no new banks, you know, which has been a long-term cycle, is you always see some banks being acquired by large banks, and then there was new banks being created. We went through three or four years, there was you know, maybe one or two de novo bank. I think now we're starting to see more volume. So you, it's like inventory. If you take inventory out, if you don't replace it, your inventory is going to go down. I think now we're replacing it more with more de novo banks and more operations. So I do think that that part will be healthy and we'll see that flatten out. I also think this is a really great time to be an independent bank um, because your returns are back to a satisfactory level and there are new products. If you think about it, a lot of times people who banked at small banks, 
the next generation didn't want to bank at that small bank because they didn't have online banking and they didn't have mobile banking and they didn't have a national uh, ATM network. But all of a sudden now, those smaller banks can buy those services from providers or fintechs. And so they're sticking around more because they like the culture of those small banks. And, and so I do think that small banks are going to re, re-carve out a niche for themselves in, in the history of American banking. Great. And this is now the Lanyap section. It means something extra down in Louisiana. You're the last speaker of the 100th anniversary of CBA. Parting words. Um, first of all, I, I would say uh, to, the, to all of you that are bankers in the audience, thank you for what you do. Um, you are often the nucleus of communities across America. Um, without you, communities don't have the opportunity to save for their children's education, to buy their first home, um, to buy that automobile, to go and get guidance um, and insight about financial services. That is usually done by bankers across America. Um, I would also say I find it unfortunate um, that the reputation of banks have been tarnished and we're all working hard to rebuild, I think, our stature across America. We deserve that stature, I believe, bankers do across America for what they do. Um, And I would say stay with it and make sure that you do put your customers you know, first in that process. It's very important um, for us to build our credibility and for you to maintain your credibility across America. Joseph Odding, thank you very much.